bowl um, for this punch bowl. Now it's necessary to make the stem for it, um, as I shall be showing how to make stem bowls later in chalices as well. So all I'm going to do is throw a cylinder and make a wide base and then bring the cylinder out at the top so we can later place the bowl on top and join the two together and they're leather hard. Now we have the centre of the pot. So we made the bowl um, for this punch bowl. Now it's necessary to make the stem for it, um, as I shall be showing how to make stem bowls later in chalices as well. So all I'm going to do is throw a cylinder and make a wide base and then bring the cylinder out at the top so we can later place the bowl on top and join the two together and they're leather hard. Now we have the centre of the pot, so we've put the ball of clay into a uh, cone shape onto here, thrown it on and now make the wheel go fairly fast. With both hands, one hand over the other to press down, keep it in the centre, arms on the side of the wheel, and squeeze the clay together, one hand over the other like that, push down, squeeze up, keeping your hands rock solid, squeeze down, repeat that process until the clay is absolutely even. so we can bring it up more again. A little thinner again here, top. Some reason. 
not impossible to deal with it. It's gone slightly off centre at the top here. So the trick is to make it even all the way to the rim and then take a piece of wire or a needle, this tool here, or to take this tool here and cut off the rim. Now you can either use a wire like that or you can use the needle, wet the needle, hold it in place, cut through. So you just lift it off. I think the wire is actually better, it doesn't stick as much. Then hold the pot still again, and voila, you have a, a nice even top again. So, do a slightly thinner there again. I wanted to have a second shape below here, which I'm going to make fluted and be in a wavy line. I'm just going to finish off pinching up this edge of this pot so that it fits neatly the sharp edge onto the bowl when the bowl fits onto it. Now, I want to push in here and make a piece come out that I can use for fluting later to make this wavy. I'll show you how I put water on it to make it smooth. Stick my fingers so. Just a nice shape out of that. And as you see now, this part becomes a bit wider, so I want to narrow that down again and get it level. Go right into the base of the bowl. If I am still, the clay should follow. So you see I brought that back into centre now. I'll do the same down here. Just bring that in and outward. to a bat. And that is not always quite so easy as it might seem. Water around the pot, cheese wire again, to pull the water under the piece of ceramic, under the clay. And pull it twice, clean the wire the second time again, to get the clay off the wire and to pull the water under the pot. Now, it's possible to get it off with our fingers, but in this case you might need a paint scraper, a spatula, to get it off. Wet that slightly before you start, so it doesn't stick. And then you should be able to push, push the pot across and lift it off. It's as easy as that. And there we are. Voila. So we have our two halves ready to put together. The top part <coughs> has to be trimmed at the bottom to fit onto the lower part here. And we should glue them together with some liquid clay of the same type called slip. We have to turn them first, we have to put them back on the wheel first to turn them neatly so they'll fit together. Now you see this rather nice effect I have on the side of this jug here, just below the neck, uh, of the wavy pattern coming around and then the little circles in it. 
this is what I want to do uh, around the rim of the, uh, the base of this punch bowl. And all I'm going to do is um, use my fingers like this, two one way, one the other, to pull it up and down. Then I've gone round with a piece of bamboo afterwards to make the circles. I've got an abandoning wheel so that I can turn it easily like this. And all I have to do is go around like this with my fingers, carefully here, and pull two up and one down. Put my thumb where the previous finger was, like that. Two up, one down, to be a little bit bigger. Just pull it over. It's the same way as making a lip on a jug. If I was making a, a lip on a jug, I would do the same here. Two fingers one way, a finger the other, and pull the lip out. But we'll demonstrate that later. And we can use a sponge at the end just to get things a little tidier and neater. And hopefully things will level out so that the uh, curves meet up. Huh? Like that. That last one was a little bit messier, but we'll tidy it a bit now. There we go. Now, I want to go round in there with the piece of bamboo. Just make those circles again. I rather really like that pattern. Kind of a slight trademark of mine. By doing that. And this is called a banding wheel. It's called a banding wheel that the pot is on, this metal one down, down below, because uh, it's used to put bands on pots. You spin the pot like that with a brush against the pot and put a band around the pot. There we go, finished. Now we come to joining these two parts of the bowl and the base together. And the bowl, when it's turned upside down for turning, won't fit the wheel. So what I've done is to use a paint tin or any large round container that will go on the wheel head and then invert the pot over it and we can turn the base of the bowl there. Okay, I've lifted the base onto this now and we've put some slip in between the joints and now I just have to take this kidney, uh, metal kidney spoon and just smooth it round to get it, uh, you could actually put it back on the wheel and um, turn it again which would be also a very good way to do this but the kidney will give me a smooth finish as well, very useful piece of metal, you can get them in rubber and plastic as well. And I just have to drill the holes at the top of the edge to get the lace work here and my design will be done. To be a little bit careful because it's starting to be a bit soft here and needs to settle a while before I do much more work on it. But I'll just get this bit done here. Using the spoon like this I'm both scraping it and smoothing it at the same time. I'm smoothing a little bit of clay along as I scrape it off into the joint. The idea is that we should hardly be able to see a joint here at all by the time we finished. So, we're just scraping it round, getting it absolutely as level as we can, as if the whole pot is one piece. To blend the two surfaces totally together and just smooth off any wrinkles. here as well. And the finger marks them earlier. So we drill the holes opposite and that way we can do one by one and know that we will eventually link up. So we've done the four with that size drill. I'm going to take a larger drill still and we'll do the holes in between. As I say, this way we're guaranteed that it will work out exact. You can do all sorts of lattice work like this. More holes. The only trouble is you have to be very careful with the pot afterwards because obviously this outer edge is going to be quite delicate and to get it into the kiln, especially with a top loader, 
going to be quite awkward with you. Mustn't touch this edge very much. No diamond size again. We don't have to keep these absolutely straight as we go around. We can start putting the patterns up and down to make a, a wavy line. Now, whether we do more, we have to think carefully. We could uh, have some small holes, very small ones, each side there. I think actually that's enough. I think that's quite effective. Same underneath. Because what you've got to remember with clay and pottery is that anything that is soft in clay now is going to be hard as stone later. And a little sharp edge here may seem very soft while it's still wet clay. But clearly, once it's been fired, that's a very different matter. That's going to be hard and sharp then. So we need to get surfaces smooth if they're going to be dangerous or be touched by the client or the new owner of the pot later. little marks inside, take them out now, although the glaze will cover most of this. We should be using a, a matte glaze I suspect on this. Okay, that's finished. As you can see here, uh, the pot on the right hand side is a composite of four pots, a tall thrown cylinder and three ordinary bowls turned upside down. And then after that, uh, three smaller pieces put on top thrown to hold smaller candles. This is to hold a very large candle later. Now the pot on the left, the jug, let me just show you that a moment because I'll be going into detail on how to make the handles and do everything else. But we're just about to go on to how to turn a pot. That is when the pot is finished and is leather hard, then we have to... Uh, turn the pot upside down and turn what's called a foot rim so that the pot is level. If I take it off its base a moment you can see there that I've turned a rim underneath it and on the edges here on the lower edge to make it stand level on a surface. Now let's show you how to do that it's very important. Here you see a bowl on the wheel that's just been done. You can see it's upside down and it was held on by three small pieces of clay. And you can see where I've turned the base of it into another ring. And that will now stand level and steady. Let's show you how that's done. So we place the pot according to the rings on the actual wheel which help us to centre it. To get it just where it uh, was originally, uh, in the centre of the wheel. And then we take three small pieces of clay and put those around the pot just to hold it in place. You don't have to stick tremendously tightly, just not to stop it wobbling. Then we have a choice of several tools. These are they. This turning tool. This one. Well, a paint scraper in fact, but it's got a very useful series of edges for turning. And 
This little one with the loop is very useful as well. Let me show you how they work. We have to put our arms on the side of the wheel again, on the side of the wheel base, and keep our hands very steady here like this. To be able to turn off, <coughs> to, to turn out the bottom of the base here and the side here, and make it nice and neat and tidy, and have an even foot rim. Let's turn the motor on. I'm going quite slowly. I usually start with the base just to level out the base slightly, bit the centre a little bit to make it slightly lower than the rest of the pot and level out the surface of the base. And you'll see a spiral line of clay coming off the edge of this tool. So we can use that tool in that way. Or we could use the, the loop equally as well by doing this. Very useful tool again. Keep it absolutely still so that if there's the slightest bump, the, uh, the tool will have to cut the rim evenly and the base of our pot will be even. the larger paint scraper tool which I find very very useful. The same sort of thing, trim the top off here or cut in to find our inner circle. You see there it isn't quite level this part, it could have been a bit better centered. Cut down into that edge, about a quarter of an inch in this case, it's only a small pot. The bigger the pot, the larger you may make the foot room. You don't want to be going through the base. Be very careful that you uh, don't go too deep into the base of the pot. And then level off that rib bit of the rim. And come back to here. Get this nice and level. I keep the turning tool still now so that we have an equal rim that is the same diameter all the way around. And then this way. And it's just like a lathe. We'll see in this particular film the use of a lathe as well and how a very similar technique is used to trim the wood off when it spins around. Having got that nicely finished, all we have to do is take a damp sponge just to finish off the top of the pot, make it nice and neat and smooth and tidy again. And voila, we have finished our foot room. Take off the little bits of clay. Now these scraps that we've got here are very useful because we can use these later uh, to mix with water to make a slip to make our glue. So some of these little trimmings not only can be turned back into clay to re-throw a pot with, but also to make the glue with. There we go. And you can see the uh, and you can see the finished foot rim. And here we are with this nice selection of shapes for you and the uh, applied decoration. And you see here that I've also done the handles on this pot now and, uh, and pushed in the decoration into that one slightly. So we've got incised decoration and the external applied decoration. You can also see the different types of handle that we've got, with it coming up and over, pushed on there and then brought round, pushed onto the actual pot, brought across, pushed down and then pulled up and blended in. Next we need to turn the bases on these casseroles we made. You see they're still flat and messy at the moment. And then put the handles on these sides. The lids also need turning. This is the one for that big pot there. Should fit okay now. It's just a matter of uh, just dry enough. Yes, you see it'll be nice when it's turned down. We can make a, a top on here. Either put a handle over it or bring it up into a a shape for a normal handle, which I might do. It's still a little bit soft for my liking. 
Might have to wait a bit longer yet on those. Okay, before we start using clay, let's look at a few of the tools that we can use when making pottery. You can make many of your own. For instance, this piece here, this piece of cane that I've cut off, is quite useful for making little eyes or circles in, in the clay. Ordinary paint scraper here for lifting pots off or for smoothing. Um, various dinner knives we can cut to shape and size as we want. That one's very useful for smoothing the clay out and, and modelling. And this one I've cut to a fine point for fettling, as we call it fettling, is for trimming a pot for the finer point. This is called a kidney tool for smoothing clay um, and for smoothing off the surfaces. Another one here for when you're throwing as well. This little tool is quite fun. You can mould it along to make a pattern. These are modelling tools you can make out of a piece of stick or dowel rod and here's the professional or plastic ones. Sponges are always needed, several sponges, ones for both the throwing and cleaning up. Uh, a rolling pin obviously for rolling out clay and battens to go uh, to get the thickness of your clay when rolling the clay to a certain thickness you require the same as the batten. Spoons, forks, all of these little tools are very useful and these tools are very important called turning tools for turning the base of the pots on the wheels I will show you later. A piece of twisted wire with stick at each end for cutting the pots off or for cutting through clay. Uh, calipers for measuring the width of pots for lids and so on to get them all identical and the same and this very useful tool which is also a turning tool but can be used for gouging out or modelling clay and cutting areas or hollowing out clay as well. Brushes of various sorts, these are nearly all hakes and Chinese brushes, we'll be dealing with those later but all for very different uses, some of the beautiful ones here as you see for painting larger areas, uh, brush decorations, Chinese and Jap Japanese decorations and the hakes, the, uh, the flat horsehair ones and we've got various round ones for lettering and sort of calligraphy and right down to the smallest brushes of all for doing very fine work. So, we've got all the basic tools you require there really for doing our pottery. Many as you say you can just take from the uh, scrap tip or from the old kitchen drawer of old knives, some you can make yourself and some you need to buy. The sieve is useful for pushing clay through, we can actually push clay through this to make a hairy effect. Um, now there are other tools you can use when mixing glazes, uh, mesh sieves to, to, um, to thin the glaze out, to get the mess out of it, to make it fine, to make it even. And there are other uh, larger uh, pieces of equipment like the pottery wheel or a pug mill for actually blending clay and taking it through and, and uh, pushing it together. But uh, for the basics this is all you're going to need in a small studio pottery. Some more new pots. This time applied decoration again and much smaller pots thrown to use as sea forms and added to the other pot. Let's continue looking at this applied decoration now. You see here I've thrown little pots and placed them on around my main body of the pot. It's another form of applied decoration. In this case I'm basing my pots on plant forms and sea forms. But if we take a piece of clay and roll it out to be a sausage and then to make little circles, to make little spheres, balls, I just break these off to the sizes I want. And I can then have about the same size balls of each one because I know the amount I've broken off. It's a very quick way of making little balls for decoration. You used it late, earlier on on that jug when I put a decoration around it. Then flatten them out by pinching and we can make some delightful little flowers this way. Of course, there's all sorts of variations you could do doing this. You could cut the petal shapes out. Right, if I then take one of these smaller ones and pinch it into this sort of shape to the inner petals, put that inside a slightly larger one and pinch that in and around that, it gives me quite a nice little flower, you see. It gives me quite a nice little flower. And that I can then take some of the slip with. This is the liquid clay that I've had earlier from throwing. I've mushed it all up to make it just the right consistency. You must glue things on with clay always. A little bit of that slip onto there. This is ordinary slip, not decorative slip. That's quite different to a casting slip we'll discuss in a moment. And that I can then place onto my pot and it will stick and stay there. If you just use water it will not stay. And that's the point. People so often think that just using water is enough to stick a piece of pottery together. It's not. It sticks temporarily when the water dries off the piece of pottery just falls off. So you must use the same clay that you're working with 
as a slip to stick things on with. Right, so we'll just bunch that one up again, put it inside this one, and pinch them together, and then a little bit of slip. Et voila, have our flower ready to go on. Take that round there, just place it onto there. Gently push the moulding and he's there. We may put a smaller one inside in a moment, but I think four should be enough. Board casting slip into these earlier. You can see the thickness here now that it's now formed about a oh, quarter of an inch, so it's ready to pour out. So I'll take the whole mould and we just pour the whole some nozzle back into the bucket. And that leaves us with that layer inside the mould which will dry off now and I can trim into the chicken brick. Need to mend that mould there where that bit's chipped out. We could now take this mould apart and we should be able to see what's inside it was in one go. We can then trim it as well. There we go, look, it's half of a chicken brick. It's like bubble there we can touch up. So what I have to do now is get my fettle and knife. In this particular case, this clay is an earthenware clay. Um, most of the uh, casting slips are earthenware, but you can get it in stoneware as well. And we trim away this part here. If I do that while this is still in the mould, uh, it's a lot easier for it to be supported. All the way around this part. There. This is uh, unfortunately the mould has been slightly damaged here, which is not good. I've got to just work on that a little bit. And while it's in the mould, I'll just need to touch that bit up there. So I've got this half back on again now. Turn it the other way up. Take that half off. Let me open a minute. So, we can trim this half. Round to there. And uh, we can just mend that little hole now as well that was down here where the bubble was. I'll just uh, use a little of this slip. It takes a small amount of water on it to make it wet enough again. Just place that onto there and then wet it on. And there we are. Mended as easily as that. And this part should come out. So, all we have to do is just trim this up. Very delicate these moulds, you've got to be fairly careful. With a small piece of sponge. Smooth off the joint. It's 
So, if anything's too wet or this stuff will start collapsing again because it is, say, very fragile stuff, casting slip. Get that away. Over here, carefully. Put the mould back together for a second casting. in between, not going to leak. Band around it to keep it together. There we go, ready to pour again. Now hopefully this half will be okay. I'll just check that. It again. Now these bits can be saved and reused again. has to be trimmed off level there and it should just fit on top then without a problem. Carefully. My tip of my knife all the way around to there. Lift that off. While it's still in there I'll just sponge it around. Put this half back on again. this bit. And these are very nice for doing decoration on. You can just put a plain glaze on them but with all the feathers on this uh, particular piece you can imagine we could go multicolour like a copper if you wanted to. And just again sponge that round. Now very carefully lift it off and up and any little adjustments that need doing, now's the time to do it. With a little bit of strengthening just there, I think. Don't think that's going to quite fit yet. Let's look and see. No. It's supposed to fit inside there, but I've got a slight rim that has to be trimmed yet. Almost. I'm not happy with this piece here. need to mend this little piece of damage here that's been done. Just wet a bit of clay. Join that in there just to make it a little bit stronger because I'm not happy it's very very thin this particular cast I've done. Usually I make them a little bit heavier than this. Sponge that smooth. And there we are. That can be fired as that is. Voila! 
This brings me to showing you how to make some very simple parts without needing the wheel at all. And in fact, when beginners come here, uh, they always want to go on the wheel, but that's not the way we go. Um, if they wish, particularly wish to learn, learn, okay, if that's a demand. But uh, the chances are you won't make pots very quickly on the wheel. It takes a long time to learn. It's like riding a bicycle. Some people can get on there and balance in uh, two goes. Other people it takes years just to learn to balance. And it's, it's the same with throwing. You might throw very quickly in your first time. You might learn to centre, but it, you may not. But these ways I'm going to show you, um, you will uh, succeed with, and you can make pots as big as you like. I mean, up to three foot tall this way. See, the Africans making pots these way, uh, this way naturally uh, in their country and firing them in, in, in wood-fired kilns, or just the bonfires. Now, the first thing I'm going to show you is, uh, you see how we keep the clay in plastic bags here. Uh, that's the point to mention, actually, is when you're working on pots, keep them inside a plastic uh, sheet or plastic bag and they will stay wet forever. They'll stay wet as long as the plastic is sealed and the air can't escape. When you finish that, then you must dry them really well. If the pots aren't fully dry, you can't fire them. The, dry, the pots have to be as dry as possible before you put them in the kiln. And the test of that is if you nick it with your finger like that and it goes a lighter colour than the body that you're seeing, it's usually dry. You can feel by touch. Um, and then when you do your first firing, which is called the biscuit firing, you have to go very, very slowly uh, once you've succeeded in firing that uh, first firing at a lower temperature, because anything over 500 degrees has fluxed, has melted, becomes uh, clay to pottery, it's no longer clay, it won't melt down again. Then the second firing, the glaze firing, is much quicker, and you can go to a much higher temperature much more quickly without them blowing up. You must be very careful not to trap air inside a pot or have impurities in there like plaster, and it must be perfectly dry before firing. Now let's go back onto this first way of making pots. It's called pinch pottery. And uh, it's, it's very easy to make small, quick animals and all sorts of things this way. And pots to say about this size, pleasant little vases and decorations. Let's just have to show you how we do it. So, so you could use a spoon for this as a tool, an ordinary dinner knife or just bits of wood. And roll the, ball, uh, roll the clay into a ball, put your thumb in until you almost reach your, thing, your hand at the bottom here. You can just feel it starting. Pull with your fingertips from the bottom upwards and around your thumb, otherwise you'll come outwards, you can come outwards later, and pinch from the bottom, gradually coming up and up towards the rim of the pot like this, and you make a very, very quick pinch pot. And you know, you can see how fast that is. Now, if we make two of these, we can put them together and put newspaper inside to support them, and the newspaper will burn out later. And for instance, if you put two together with newspaper in, you make four little ones for the legs, another one for the head, you've got a piggy bank. It's so quick, it's so easy. Little birds and all sorts you can make that way. Let me show you two we've already made. So here are two that we've already made that way. I made this little one. And you see the two halves put together like that and then I put on the wings and tail separately and two feet and a couple of ears to make a little owl. Now to make this fluffy stuff, that's very simple as well, we'll show you that in a moment. And the young boy with me, he made this fish, two halves together, the fins, modelled the mouth, put a little bit of fluff on top and put the tail on. So very, very quick to make little animals or sheep or bowls. So we'll just finish off uh, showing you what to do with this. And then, I'll show you how to make that furry stuff. Right, so we can uh, shape these now by smoothing the inside with either a spoon or in this case a knife. You can see it's quite easy to smooth and by patting it. Now, when you pat clay, you compress the molecules. And when you compress the molecules like this, it becomes softer because the water is being squeezed between the molecules and is trying to escape. So it becomes much softer and a little bit uh, collapsible and you might have to leave it for a little while when you've been shaping like this uh, before continuing because it needs to dry out just a fraction. You can pinch them quite thin and if you're using a clay like a porcelain clay which is a very high firing translucent uh, clay when it's been fired um, you can make some beautiful effects with this by pinching things very very thin as you can indeed still throw them thinly on the wheel. We carry on with this and you must remember that clay is a wonderful material in itself. 
it isn't just to mimic other things. Okay, we can make things like birds and animals and plants and fish with it and make them look like that, but uh, it's like doing a painting, you know, why not, why not take a photograph um, rather than have to paint it? All it does is show your skill. Um, well, in this case of pottery, we want to make something that's a little bit different. So why not make these things a little bit different and use the beauty of the material itself? Now, there's something you can do with clay. You see this, this edge can be pinched right up thin and so thin that you actually start to break it away. And you can actually break and pinch the edge of the clay away, look, to give a very sharp edge which you cannot get in any other way. You wouldn't get this throwing. You could pull this out after throwing a pot, but we can get this lovely edge by breaking away the, the, the lip here, pinching it and breaking it away, that you can't get any other way and is only possible with this material called clay. So there you see that lovely edge we can get. Now, if you want to make a rim to that, so we'll just smooth the inside a little bit more and we can still make a rim as, as if it were a normal pot by just tapping the base down and then if I take my knife edge or a piece of stick, it doesn't matter which, just go around here just gently pushing the very edge of the stick so and it gives us a little foot rim almost as if it were thrown on the wheel And you could even then go around the inside like this to make a hollow underneath, but I don't need to do that. I'll just tap it down a bit and I have a fun little pinch pot. If I put two together, then I could make larger things, animals, and I could even add this to throne pots to add areas or heads or um, uh, mini ball shape or semi-spherical shape on that I wanted to do. So there we are, a simple little pinch pot. That's called a pinch pottery or a thumb pot where you put your thumb in. I'll put that one over there to dry because I will find that one. And we've been talking about applied in, uh, decoration. We, we mentioned this, that of course you can um, make applied decoration with any tool that's pushed in. So I can make a nice interesting surface on the outside here, almost wood-like, almost bark-like, by going around with the fork like this. And we've got a fun little pot. Now, I'll just show you something else while I'm at, at this because I see this quite often in shops and they, they're very expensive when you see them in shops, some of these things. Obviously, yes, we have to have the materials and the kiln and everything else. But uh, I've seen people making little mushrooms. So let's have a look at doing a little mushroom effect, shall we? Um, I'm going to take a bit of that to one side, make this into a ball and what we'll do is we'll make a small pinch pot, so just take a little piece of newspaper because we want this to be hollow. We don't want anything to be over an inch thick. Half an inch is normally the maximum, but an inch thick is pushing it. So we'll just make, otherwise the clay can explode and we don't want that to happen, do we? So there we are, a little, little dish I've made there. Now if I take a bit of newspaper, Press them over there. Somewhere. Take some newspaper and just tear a piece off. Bundle it up and it will support the clay over the top so that we have this little island, this little sphere there and it's not a solid lump of clay. Now, what I'll do now is take a couple of pieces of this clay and make our stems, so and so and they can go on there and there in a moment we'll need the slip again for sticking, remember we need the slip as glue in my pot of slip over now. Just take the plastic off it because it was keeping nice and wet. Now I'm just going to use my knife 
to push up underneath this edge here a little, like so, and lift it out, giving that little vulva that uh, often many fungi have, up around here. I will take two pieces of this and we'll do the reverse again. We'll make our little pinch pots. So you see this way, using thumb pottery and pinch pottery, there's so much fun you can have doing such simple things. That's that. Now this one. And rather than make ordinary mushrooms, I'm just going to show you the effects we can get by applying decorations to our further, further. We're going to make some toastals rather than mushrooms. Just to support these while I'm working, because I want to keep them curved, a bit more paper. paper, move that over there a moment, just out of the way, just underneath these fungi to support them for a minute while I work. So, so, a little bit more clay and I'm going to roll a coil and take some of that coil off and just go thin it out with my fingers and then just go around the outside just adding like this Pinching upwards, you see, to give this feeling of the fungi flaking slightly. Go up top again and do a bit more. Just to give the texture. Down here I'll put the same, but I'll put it a little bit more towards the bottom this time. Just pinch a little on, going on the edges like that. Going around like wood, like roof tiles, one on top of the other. And just finish off in the centre again. There we go. Now, underneath, we can take the paper away, it's just supporting for a minute, and we can go the effect of the fungi underneath, or the uh, gills, they call them. So, to give a rougher edge at the corners as well. There we are, and this one too, from the middle outwards. So you can make little birds or toads or any animals to go with these, snails, whatever you like. Should we make a little snail as well, just for fun? Right, I'll take some slip, put it on there, stick that in there, same here, stick that in there, take some slip and put it on here. And we'll stick our wee mushrooms on. Maybe a bit more towards the back. We can break that upwards slightly. So, this one back here for you. Stick him on. Now, just break that upwards a bit. Like the other one. Maybe we'll just let that mushroom tilt back a bit. Now let's make a wee snail. Yeah? We'll just make a slug first and then we'll pinch his head up into four little prongs. So He has his four eyes. And we'll stick him on there. Bit of slip. And he needs a shell. 
So let's make a shell. I'll make a long spiral for the shell, I think. And we'll just go round and round. So. There we are. Just join his shell up a bit. It's not a very big shell, it doesn't need a very big one, and I'll put a little bit on the end. And just join that on there. And we'll try sticking that on to his back. Voila! A snail. I told you about making furry stuff just now, which is rather fun. You can come around there, looking up and about. Just move his head a bit, make him a bit more lively. If I take a sieve and some of the clay, and through the sieve, I push the clay so you see it comes out like fur. Isn't that fun? And we can take that off with the knife and stick it on wherever you want. So here, a little bit of slip, and the clay, and he has a little bit of grass to eat. And there we have a little snail and some fairy grass. As quick and as easy as that. So how fast it was. Now you can take much more time modelling, obviously, if you want to. I can come back with this now and I can apply more decoration if I want. And the rest I can do with glazes. So we'll keep that for fun. Now that here's another decoration called impressed decoration. Let's have a look at that. We've done applied, but we can push into things as well. So we'll just take our rolling pin and a couple of battens each side so we get a level piece of clay. So, a bit more maybe. Just a little more there, yes, that's good. And we take what what's called a tile cutter here, look. And this tile cutter is a, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six sided septagon. And we press that into there, lift it out, so you can make your own tiles for your own bathroom, press that and voila, you have a nice neatly cut tile. Now into that we can have some fun. I can press this, these are bits of wood or decorations you can buy them, the plastic ones in the shops to um, stick on to wardrobes and things. But if I put that here and press it in, you can see that it will leave rather a nice pattern. And this is impressed decoration. So you could do this with leaves, with bits of stick, shells, anything that will leave and make a pattern. That's rather fun. I can go around the edge of this one. Make the pattern as much as you want, as many as you want. There we are, you see? And that can be done with a leaf or with uh, shells or bits of nut, anything you like that's got a texture to it. Okay, well, I'll keep that one because I can play around with that with doing some glazing later. Now we come to our final. Um, way of making pottery because we've done uh, uh, pinch pots, thumb pots, throwing, we've shown you the different sorts of applied and impressed decorations. It's time now to look at the one of the best and easiest methods of making large pots quickly and that's called coil pottery. So for that I'm going to need my banding wheel This is a banding wheel, and don't forget you always hold it both top and bottom, especially the bottom, because they do come apart and they're cast iron. And if the bottom drops out, it will smash on the floor. Now 
it's probably best to put a bit of paper on here first to work on because the pot can stick otherwise. So just a piece of paper towel or again a piece of newspaper and we'll make a base. And you can make a bigger pot as you want this way, you can make it huge. Make a pot as big as yourself this way if the kiln will take it. First of all I want a nice base on here. That's a little bit too big. You reckon on uh, when throwing a pound in weight of clay to a pint pot, but when you're doing obviously you're doing cold pottery, it's a little bit different. Make a ball, flatten it out, trim that later. This will be my base, and obviously quite a big pot. Use a rolling pin perhaps. Let's get it a bit more level. Now I don't necessarily want to have a round pot, even though I'm doing a, a round shape, I'm going to push it a little bit uh, more elliptical, because I would like actually to make a large elliptical pot that comes up like this. So, so I'll just trim that to the size and shape I want to start with. Yes, I nearly forgot, there's one technique I haven't shown you yet, and that's slab pottery. And we do that in a very similar way to doing this rolling here, by rolling slabs out first, putting them together. Anyway, we'll carry on with the, with the coil pots for the moment. So what we do now... ...is roll out our coils and you see I'm rolling actually on hessian because lovely stuff hessian the clay doesn't stick to it and you can just brush it off afterwards when it's dry roll out our coils and you want to make the coils twice as thick as the wall of the pot you want to finish with after the technique I'm going to show you you might say well you should have made them three times as thick but twice will do you'll see why you put the coil on you don't need to use slip at all now you can either join them up directly or even go in a snake. And then you take one third from the outside and join it downwards like that. You can make a very nice pattern this way as well. Some people just like to leave that pattern as it is. One third all the way around. You see why a banding wheel is useful now because we can actually move the whole pot round as we go along. And weld it to the pot underneath inside and outside, one third. And strangely enough in doing that you'll end up with about half the thickness of the wall you started with, which is why I said start with a coil twice as thick as the wall of the pot that you want. Although you're taking thirds you'd think you would end up with only one third at the end. It doesn't quite work that way and you still tend to end up with a half. So again we go on Roll. roll from the middle outwards, as I'm doing here, roll from the middle outwards, so don't roll from the outside in or just at each end, roll from the middle outwards and you'll get a nice even coil. If it goes too thin somewhere you can always break it off and double it on again and roll it again, look, it's so easy. So I've just shown you what happens if you make a mistake. You can break it in half if the coil's too long, don't get them elliptical, if it goes flat one way, turn it up there, squeeze a little bit and then roll again. So there's another problem solved, if you have that problem. And then when you get that done, we go around again, round and around and around. Don't come out too much at this stage, you can shape it slightly, but it's like throwing, it's always best to build the, the, uh, the shape uh, cylinder first and then tap it more outwards. If you come out too far to start with, the whole thing will collapse on you. And so we come up and up. So now I'm going to come outward slightly at the end, but not at the side because I want this shape pot. And again, one third on the outside, all the way down, all the way down. 
pushing that third to join the joints all the way down. I usually do the outside first and then the inside afterwards, using my fingertip to push a piece of clay from there, you see, down like that. My fingertip. And this is called coil pottery. It's a very efficient and quick way to make quite a big pot. In fact, you know, you're safer doing this than you are throwing. And it's possible to uh, throw a pot to go on top of this, and it's possible to coil on top of a leather hard thrown pot in the same way. So everything, everything links together. This stage, because it's fairly low down, I'm just going to smooth out the inside a bit because I'm going to have a job to get in here later. I know it's not going to be an open top pot, so I'm going to just smooth some of this now. Not that anybody will ever see inside it, but I feel better to do that. Each to his own in this case. Now I'm going to carry on building up, so I'll turn the camera off for the minute and I'll show you more in a moment. The other thing to remember when making coil pots, you see I've only got two coils at a time here because my thumb is only so long. My thumb is only about the width of two coils together, so it's okay doing the outside, you can, you can join as many as you want. When you come to doing the inside, of course, a different matter. So you see here I'm joining two coils together by welding them down. When I want to go on the inside with my thumb, like so, then I can only reach down two coils. So it would be unwise of me to do more than two at a time, or I'd have trouble blending them easily and properly. Now here we have the nearly finished pot, just uh, shaping and smoothing a bit before I put the final thrown pieces on top. I decided to have two spouts, two necks. I mean, if you're going to have a thrown pot, you only have one. But as I'm doing a more unusual shape here, I've got uh, every opportunity to do it very creatively and as entirely as I wish, and as the pot seems to demand. I'm just going around with the knife, doing my final shaping here to get it to a nice shape for the necks of these other cylinders to go on to. I'm rounding them off a bit, ready to support that. Also making sure the pot is not leaning because now I have a chance to see it as a whole. I'm drinking it just one side at a time. I can still bring the outside into shape from the pushing the inside out if I want. Once I get these two spouts on though, I'll only, have to be, I'll only be able to shape from the outside. There, now we let that go a little bit harder because it has to be able to support these two pieces that are going to be thrown onto there. And here you can see the uh, two thrown pots on top. All you have to do is blend them in. So we had a bit more clay just to get a really nice shape. Now to build a slab pot, it's a very simple technique again, uh, it's a lot to do with timing, I'll just show you a little here. All we have to do is use the battens, get these bits, uh, 
and roll out our clay. I'm going to do a bigger slab pot later that I'll show you straight after demonstrating here on the, on the video, even though I'll make it later. So roll out our clay, slab pots this is. And the slab doesn't have to be actually square. A slab pot can be a wavy shape if you want. It's all a matter like cutting paper of um, cutting things to the right. size. Right then, if we cut these to the shapes we want now, don't cut through your hessian of course, but I'm using a fairly blunt knife for this job. And you can make all sorts of shapes, you could make octagons this way, whatever you liked. In fact, you know, that's quite a nice idea. What I'm going to do, I think you've just given me an idea there, you know just now I made that tile, that octagon tile. Um, I'm going to do just that and make another one of those tiles as a base for this. That would be rather fun, I think. And you'll see how I mean. We can always make a lid the same way. Just to roll that out for the base. And come back with my tile cutter a moment. And just cut myself out a tile from there. Oh. Now if I measure that to cut the walls to be the same height, I should be able to make quite a nice little pot which I can cut trim later. If I'm going to need two pieces, I'll need a lid as well. Right, let's cut that off there. And there. I'll do a bit more in a minute. And how long have they got to be? They've got to be that long. And I've got to do six of them. One, two, three, four, five, six exactly. Well, how about that? Can't be bad. They're not quite level, but I'll just trim that a little bit more to get them level. I'll tell that by my eyes. And then we'll slice here. 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 six. Now we need the slip. Back and get my slip again. I just want to finish with that. Now if you're doing a larger slab pot or you want perfection then you'd be best to let these go leather hard, to let them go slightly dry so they will support themselves. I'm only doing a very small pot here so I'm hoping I can get away with this. Glue. I want the texture on the outside, on the inside of the hessian, so I'll glue that on there. And just finish on the inside. Next piece. Glue. And this time we want some glue down the edge here. And we'll add that on. So this is simple slab pottery. Now I can join that up. So if these had been left to dry, this would be an easier job to get it nice and tidy and neat because these would remain vertical and flat. But as it is, it's not too bad. here and there just to fill. And there we go, we have one side of our septagon. Is it septagon or is that seven? We have one side of our box. Next.
Just cut these last two to fit. Yeah, in a shape. And maybe put a little tabs inside just to hold it. And that will become the lid. So a little box with a lid. Let's come back now to the um, little slab pot that we did. And you see here now. I've cut the I've actually cut the lid and made it a shape so that it only fits one way. That can dry off now. Although I'm going to do some decoration on the surface here, some applied decoration. All I have to do is sponge it and I have a nice little box. As you can see, the biscuit firing has been done. Here are the pots from that firing now ready to be glazed. We've looked at glazed pots, now it's time to start looking at the unglazed ones, the biscuit ones we've just been making. You can see I've made a, a reasonable selection since. Nice big uh, coil through. You hear all these buckets of glaze that I've mixed. I mean, you could have as many glazes as there are in the catalogue, or you can mix your own. See uh, on the bucket clear 19, 980, which is the uh, temperature of the glaze I'm going to fire. This is a clear earthenware glaze, so it's virtually like a liquid glass. And the test of a glaze when you've mixed it, on the whole, is that when you put a dry finger into it, you come out with an even coating on it. Now this one's a little bit thinner, because being a clear glaze, I prefer it a little bit thinner to get the translucency. So with a, a normal glaze, I would have a nice even coating on my finger with a dry finger placed into the glaze. Now we'll look at actually underglazing here because we're going to do under, under, underglaze decorating. I'm going to take a piece of pottery. In this case, one of these chicken bricks I've been making from the moulds that I showed you. And we'll paint some special paints over that, which are oxides or special colours for pottery that don't burn away as ordinary paint would. And then we'll put the transparent glaze over the top. So we have two ways you could decorate this pot. We can put the colours directly onto the pottery in a clear glaze over the top, or I can put a white glaze on and the colours over the white glaze, which is on glaze, to melt into the glaze. So under glaze, underneath the glaze, on glaze, onto the glaze. Also we can use one glaze over another. I'll put the honey glaze on and some white glaze over the top. That's fired, the honey glaze should melt and the white glaze should melt into it and trickle down, giving an effect like a tenmuku, a hair's fur effect. Here with the two bowls on the right, you see a honey glaze and a green glaze there. The colours are never quite as they appear before they're fired. And I've put a white rim on the top so that will melt into those glazes, we hope. Now into the bottom of these two white ones with the white glaze on, I'm going to put some coloured glass. I've got some different coloured glass here, which is very effective. And that will melt on top of this white glaze into it. it gives some beautiful effects as it melts down into the glaze. Very pretty. You can see here the colours we're going to use. We just mix these in a palette with some water and paint them on the surface of either the pot or the white glaze. You'll see also that I'm using a um, special brush, a Chinese brush for this, because I can get the uh, patterns that I want quite easily then on these feathers with that. I can go relevant to the feathers or I can just paint the colours where I want them anyway. These brushes hold lots of paint so they're very very useful. Another of the beauties of the uh, Chinese brushes is that we can make such lovely, simple brushstrokes in one movement.
At the same time, while I'm doing this, I'm doing some tests on some tiles because obviously I want to have these results to be able to show people or use myself and uh, I want to check the examples I need to use at a later date. Once the colours are finished, then all we have to do is put the clear glaze over. I'll show you that in just a moment. Now this was under glazing, now we're going to put some colour on top of the white glaze. Let's go to have a bit of fun and we just made this little snail quickly to show you on the demonstration earlier with his mushroom. And I'll just put a little bit of colour onto him. Now here's the example of the tile with the various colours on. We just pop it on the surface to get a transparent glaze. So in this case we have our chicken here. And we can either dip him halfway and halfway if we had enough glaze, or we pour it all over. I'll do the inside first. You can actually fill the inside up. In and straight out. Put the glaze thickness right. You don't want to wait. And it won't take long to dry. Dip him in this case halfway. Put that down to dry before the other half is to be put in. The same for this. Dip it out. It's useful to have a full bucket of glaze, really. Half a bucket is a bit of a nuisance because you can't get in completely. Same way again. This time I'm going to pour the glaze over it. Last time I just showed you dipping halfway and I'll dip the other half. But we can put the whole chicken in one go like this. If you were to use a pair of tongs, you can, uh, glazing tongs, you can hold this with the thin points and glaze and then hardly a mark shows afterwards. Now to dip the other half. Doesn't matter if there's a slight overlap. Just touch up any parts that didn't get glazed. Now we can do the other half. And if we have a, an overlap again, we can either just touch them up or pour some glaze over. To sponge off the edges that uh, need to go on the kiln shelf, because obviously you mustn't have glaze where it's going to touch on the kiln shelves, and that will stick to the kiln. Now here you see the kiln loaded, and we have to be very careful that one pot doesn't touch another. The shelves are laid with these things in between towering. These kiln props make a column which the kiln shelves can stand upon, and on the kiln shelves we put a layer of backwash which stops the pots from sticking, or we can put these little um, stilts which, if we have glaze underneath, the tips will break off afterwards, we can file them down, but very careful of those because they're very, very sharp uh, when you take the pots off. Anyway, we're not using those today because we've uh, cleaned the underneath of the pots so they won't stick to the shelves. Now at last we'll do some glazing of these pots and uh, we'll see the results of all our hard work. Let me show you how to glaze some of these other shapes. We'll start with um, the chalices I was doing. That's this shape. There's a blue glaze here, and that's what it's supposed to be anyway. You may not look it. Um, when it's first mixed, because the colours, as you know, in ceramics don't always resemble what they turn out to be when they chemically react with heat and fuse. So we pour the inside of a chalice first, like this. Get a nice even layer, the thickness we want, so we have to mix the glaze to the right consistency to start with. And then, we don't want glaze in the bottom, so we dip it like that, just up to the edge. Just hang on a moment. And away. And in this case, I want a slight rim of white. It's going to swirl the white around a bit. And we'll just put, while it's still damp, we've missed a bit there. Look, the air uh, the has been trapped around that edge. So we'll just use our finger with a bit of wet glaze just to touch that up. So, and here. And then a tad of white on the outer edge. While it's still damp, twist the pot, shake it off, 
so the dribbles come off, otherwise they'll trickle down the side of the pot later, which is not what we want. And there we are, ready to go in the kiln. It's as easy as that. Now with a big bowl there are several techniques we can use, but in this case I'm going to try and do it all in one go. Always do the inside of a bowl first, we pour the glaze into the inside, and then turning the bowl, hope you have enough glaze to go all the way around. If not, just keep it more quick, because while it's still wet it'll blend. And voila, we have covered the inside of the bowl. And it's just the outside. Now in this case it's a stem bowl, so it's a lot more difficult. But I'm going to have to pour it round the outside edge. So starting from the far edge, as far around as I can reach, pour it so that it goes back into the bucket. So let that dry off and have to do the bottom bit. Normally with a bowl I could hold it here and that would be the finish of it now, but this being a much larger object. Not quite so easy. Let's draw a little bit now. And then finally, into the lower half of it. And it should be going all the way around the pot. Check it in a moment, but it should have gone all the way around. Yep, just a little bit there, not touched. So we'll just pour a small amount back on there. It's just an awkward shape to do, being a, a fluted pot. There we go, it's ready now. Bottle. We don't need to completely fill it because we're going to be emptying it and dip it upside down. This is where you need to have enough glaze, really. Not quite enough there. Dry off. I can dip the bottom and sponge the base off. Slight waste of glaze doing that, but uh, sometimes the only way. That dry off again. Touching up to do. Just here. Finger marks. Now on these flowers, I'm just going to get a brush of white onto these so it'll melt in. There we go. Do remember to wipe the base of the pots off at the end because you don't want them sticking to the kiln shaft. So if you haven't managed to dip them so that there isn't too much. Uh, glaze over the bottom, then you have to go back at the end and just make sure there's no glaze anyway and take it up about a quarter of an inch from the bottom so that the glaze doesn't dribble down onto the kiln shaft and stick the pot to it. There we go. When doing a very large bowl, you can't quite uh, deal with the outside of it is to put it into a big tray like this and over some battens and pour the glaze around the outside. Having already done the inside. And there we are, voila. Now finally before we fire the pieces and we finish this video, I'll show you a little bit more about decoration. I'll just take a bit of sea sponge and in this case some iron oxide and we'll go around this pot giving it a slight textural pattern and this is the oxide over a light coloured glaze it should give us quite a nice effect when it's fired we'll go around the outer edge there too now that's iron oxide which is brown then I'm going to pick up a little bit of black which is the manganese oxide and just go around again a slightly darker edge 
They're all experimental because these are new glazes and I haven't yet um, tested these out so it's going to be very interesting to see how this comes out. Right, in the final pot I'm going to show you a bit of brushwork because we haven't done brushwork yet. We'll do a little bit on paper as well and then that'll be it for the firing. Let's move on to a little bit of brushwork now. We'll use um, our Japanese or Chinese brushes here, which are rather lovely. And uh, what we're trying to do, of course, is use the brush to give natural brush strokes for an effect of something like a leaf or flowers. So in this case, to suit the pot, just very quickly, put a few nice strokes, quite simply. Don't want to overdo it. This, in this case, I'm using... Um, copper oxide. And then what we'll do is use some iron oxide just with the very tip of the brush and we'll put a few fine lines in. Same brush, just the very tip of it there now. And uh, if I want to I can take a much finer brush and just finish off with a few smaller marks here. See where the banding wheel comes into its own again now. And then go back to my big one and I'm just going to make some little dots and dashes as if they're seed heads coming on here. Let's keep it a very simple design. Just a few marks just to indicate the sort of things we want to show here. And remember that anything repeated makes a pattern, so... Don't need much, just a few marks like that will do it. Just to fit the pot. Not quite happy, so just another, don't overdo it. I want to keep, to keep it a bit simple. There we go. Maybe just bring that up there a bit to finish the design up. That'll do. Finally, back to our big pot here. I don't want to use a brush on this one. I'm going to use the sponge again and use some uh, manganese oxide. That's the black at the centre here. Just to touch on these, the middle of the sunflower design. As I say, I'm not entirely sure what this glaze is going to do in reaction to this, but it should work. Turn that round. Get the surface of this texturing again. I don't think I need to do much with these flowers. I mean, it would be tempting to try and find a yellow or some colour that will go on there, but that's not what I'm about in this particular case. Um, what we shall do then is just take a little thin coat of the iron oxide and just come across some of these petals, I think, with the Chinese brush. With a thin coat of the iron oxide. You see it's uh, the same shape as the petals anyway, so we can just in one stroke master that simple design. Second coat, give me a slightly heavier layer. Let's bring that down into there a little bit. Just going to blend. I'm just going to use a bit of painterly, more painterly work and just blend this brown into the edge here. There we go, that'll do that. See how that comes out. I've got to experiment.
and we'll see how that comes out with our firing here. Our first finished glaze firing in this cone, and the big bowl that you've seen made 